you're here, would you please stand and so we can acknowledge you and say thank you. Thank you so much. Our fall series is also sponsored by the Staley School of Leadership Studies, the College of Education, and the College of Architecture, Planning, and Design. Our committee joins the work of many of you, um, faculty, staff, and students who have been working to advance intercultural learning on our campus. Intercultural competence is the ability to understand and adapt behavior to cultural difference and commonality. It is important not only for building a healthy campus community, but also a vital competency for the global workplace. And central to developing this inter intercultural competence is story. Learning to tell our own story, hearing and understanding other stories, and embracing our shared story creates a pathway to transformation and action. As we are changed, we change the world. We believe that this speaker series provides a moment to pause in the midst of our crazy to-do lists and meetings and classes. And I don't know about you, but this fall has felt a little crazy already. Um, to create a space for story. To build and strengthen the bonds between those of us who teach and learn and work together daily. To foster understanding of how each of us, through our different perspectives and our journeys, embrace and engage and enact our shared values and principles of community. We are excited to hear today from a leader who is truly leading change at an institutional level. But to introduce first, our guest speaker is Aaron Moore. Aaron is a senior undergraduate student here at Kansas State University. He is studying civil engineering with a minor in business. His career goal is to become a civil design engineer and help build new developments in his hometown of Kansas City, Kansas, and later move on to design cutting edge infrastructure globally. Let's welcome Aaron. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Moore. I'm a senior from Kansas City, Kansas, majoring in civil engineering. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Brian Samuel, Chief Diversity and Inclusion, as our speaker today for what matters to me and why. Dr. Samuel has accumulated 25 years of service in American higher education, working exclusively in areas that emphasize access, opportunity, diversity, and inclusion. He is a Cornell University Industrial Labor Relations Certified Diversity Practitioner and holds both a Bachelor of Arts and Sciences as well as a Master's of Education degree from the University of Tennessee Chattanooga. Dr. Samuels completed his doctoral studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln where he worked with the Nebraska Central Administration Regents and Administrators to enhance access for students in marginalized and underserved populations. Dr. Samuels character characterizes his work in the area of access at, at his calling, more specifically, helping students that did not consider college a viable option to understand that college could not be an excellent choice for them. Throughout the numerous roles Dr. Samuel has held over his career, he has, rema he has remained intric intricately involved in developing and deploying concentrated special initiatives to address the interests and needs of students in marginalized and under serve populations. Dr. Samuel is a Rafaelo Noel Levez Retention Excellence Award recipient and is a member of the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity National Advisory Council. Ladies and general, gentlemen, Dr. Brian D. Samuel. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Can you all hear me pretty good if I use this lapel mic? I was starting to feel real good about everybody being here. I thought maybe, you know, you had come to hear me speak, but then uh, Kimothi Choma told me that, you know, the, the sandwiches are probably uh, the thing that, that got everybody out, you know. Uh, if, if, even if the speaker doesn't do a good job, you know you can have a great lunch. So I didn't know how to take that, but <laughs> um, I want to say thank you uh, to Dr. Uh, Priest and the 
State School leadership for inviting me here today. And good afternoon to you all. It's my pleasure to speak to you uh, about what matters to me and why. And as the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, a father of two young African-American boys, the eldest son of a single mother with three children, a survivor of a congenital prone belly syndrome, son of an incarcerated father, hailing from a uh, dilapidated, impoverished, drug-infested and crime-ridden community called Lonsdale in Knoxville, Tennessee. When I was asked to speak to you today, I was certain of my topic. There was no ambiguity uh, within me about what I would speak about. Access, opportunity, and community, and why it is important to me. But before we do that today, I want to share with you a brief story um, about a young man named Xavion Dobson.
Yeah. I don't want them to hear me.
Knoxville. No one was reaching out to the kids in the Lonsdale community about college attendance. Xavion, however, had a bright future ahead of him because he could play football. And he played for Fulton High School, a multiple state championship winning AAA powerhouse program in the state of Tennessee. Living in Lonsdale by the time I was seven years old, I had seen and witnessed much. Most notably, June 1977, a police officer shot my father for running away from a street sweep. And then they sentenced him to life in prison for running while on parole. That was his crime. By 1988, my peers were beginning to get into trouble with the law. And in early spring of that year, my friend Shannon got into trouble, and that's when it happened. After learning about Shannon's plight, my mother come to me on my way to school that morning, and she asked me what was I going to do with my life. She stated she didn't know much about colleges and universities and the Army and things of that nature. But she didn't want me shot dead in the street, a fate that was happening to black men all across the country. She didn't want me in prison like my father. And quite simply, she wanted me to find something to do with my life. And I got to tell you, it scared me half to death. It was the first time we had ever had a meaningful conversation about anything that mattered. And it lasted all of 10 seconds, but it significantly changed my life. So I sat on the couch and I drifted off to sleep. Needless to say, I didn't go to school that day. I returned to school the following day, and during which I learned that an admissions counselor was on campus from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. I asked my second period teacher, Mrs. LaRoyce Beatty, if I could go hear what he had to say. And she replied to me that she was unaware that I had ever thought about going to college. I shared with her that I didn't know anything about college, but I would love to hear what he had to say. And so she looked in my eyes and said, well, you go right ahead. And so I went and I heard Mr. George Conley talk about the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And after hearing him speak, I decided that that was my path. That was my direction. I would go to college. I applied to dozens and dozens of colleges. However, because I made a 12 on the ACT, I had a 2.3 grade point average, and I was number 33 in a class of 133 at Austin East High School class of 1988. Every one of these colleges and universities did two things. They took my money, and then they sent me a letter of rejection. They said I would never graduate, and it wouldn't be fair to admit me knowing that I couldn't graduate. Wouldn't be fair to take my money and give me an opportunity to try. So day after the day, more applications went out and more letters of rejection came in. Until one day, a letter came from the University of Tennessee, and I kid you not, I started not to read it. But something said to me that I had to read it. I had to know. And so literally, I read it over the trash can. And sure enough, it too was a letter of rejection. Dear Brian, thank you for your interest in UTC. We regret to inform you that your application for admission has been denied. But I didn't stop there. For some reason, unlike those other letters that I had received, I read the whole letter. And when I got to the bottom, in addition to learning about how many applications they had received and how hard it was to send me this letter of rejection, I learned that I had an opportunity to appeal to the appeal committee if I so choose. So I folded the letter up. I walked five miles to uh, Shoney's restaurant. Maybe you heard of Shoney's Big Boy. At the time, I was busting tables and washing dishes. And I walked back home, cleaned myself up, went to school the next morning. And I didn't go to homeroom. I didn't go to first period. I didn't do any of those things. I went straight to the library at Austin East High School. And I got a dictionary. And I looked up the word appeal. And after learning the definition of appeal, I took out two pages of a spiral bound notebook and wrote the best work of my life, my appeal letter. And when I say the best work of my life, I've, you know, I've been in front of Senate committees and unicamerals and lieutenant governors and governors and presidents and chancellors and regents and done a lot of things. 
none of them were more important than that letter. And sometime later, a letter came in the mail and it stated that I had been conditionally admitted to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. The condition was I must earn at least a 1.0 grade point average or I would be immediately dismissed. And without that access to the bachelor's degree, which means I couldn't have had an opportunity for a master's degree or a doctor in all likelihood, wouldn't be doing the work that I currently do, which is a great pride for me, helping students get access and opportunity and ultimately graduate from college and universities. I wouldn't be able to be here today. Sometime when I was doing my doctoral studies, I learned of a man by the name of John Gardner. In 1961, he wrote a book, can we be equal and excellent too? Equal and excellence. Two terms that often mean very different things and are for all intents and purposes, mutually exclusive. But do they have to be? Equal is defined as the same measure affecting all the same, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Excellence on the other hand, we don't always know what that means. We can't define it. We certainly can't describe it, but we usually know what it looks like when we see it. On the topic of excellence, Gardner wrote, I find that excellence is a curiously powerful word, a word about which people feel strongly and deeply, but it is a word that means different things to different people. As an individual contemplates the word excellence, he reads into it his own aspirations his own conception of high standards, his own hopes for a better world. And it brings powerfully to his mind evidence of the betrayal of excellence as he conceives it. He thinks not only of the greatness we might achieve, but of the mediocrity we may fall into. People don't just have different opinions about excellence. They see it from different vantage points. So it was some years later when I learned of Dr. Gardner that I realized that my appeal letter to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga was indeed a definition of excellence from my vantage point. Gardner believed that nothing had more influence on excellence than hereditary privilege. To this effect, he wrote of Molly Malone who stated, my father and my mother were fishmongers. Birth determined my occupation and my status. It determined whom, to whom I bowed, excuse me, who bowed to me, the weight of my voice in the community and the kind of suitor who sought my daughter's hand. The hereditary privilege, as he described it, was evident in the aristocracies of profession. Gardner stated we would be wise to reflect upon the fact that academic parents usually produce academic children, military parents, usually produce military children, and so forth and so on. Gardner believed that these aristocracies of profession held entrenched attitudes and a sense of membership in a special world and a developing of a separation of members from the world at large. Gardner believed that we had to bring our whole society to a place of morale, conviction, conviction excuse me, and zest for greatness and that in our pursuit of excellence, the consequences would be felt in everything we did. Gardner stated that having conflicting views about excellence is much like a disease that may not attack every organ in the body, but its resultant disability will be felt by all parts of the body. So why is access and community so important? Before I close, I want to tell you a, another uh, vignette about a gentleman by the name of Patrick. Patrick grew up in Lonsdale, as did I and Xavier. And in 1984, his mother moved him away from Lonsdale to Athens, Georgia. In 1992, Patrick decided he wanted to go to college and he had a cousin attending the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. So he showed up at fee payment with nothing more than a letter of admission. No financial aid, no housing, no orientation, no proof of measles, mumps, and rubella, 
no meal plan, no books, no schedule, nothing. At that time, I was a senior preparing for graduation and I knew the system. I had successfully navigated it and survived. I told Patrick, you can go to class, but you know, in a matter of days, they're gonna drop you for non-fee payment because that was the process then, as in many cases it is now. But I also shared with him that if you kept going to class and you kept attending, when financial aid came through for him, he could be added back to the classes if he attended every day and he made good grades. But there was a risk. He could go to class every day, do well, and the professors could still refuse to let him in the class. In which case, he would have done all that work for nothing. Knowing the risk and the rewards, he agreed. And because Patrick had no housing, he and I took turns sleeping on the floor in my dorm room at Stagmire Hall. Late October, early November, financial aid came through for Patrick. And Patrick goes to all his professors and confides in them about his plight, what he's been through, and everything that's important to him. And he asked for their signatures to be force added into the courses. And they all agreed. After acquiring the signatures, he and I go to the registrar's office to execute the force add forms. The registrar, and I kid you not, I cannot make this up. Her name was Betty Davis. <laughs> And she stated in no uncertain terms that she would not sign the forms. According to her, it wouldn't be fair. According to her, too many students had completed their financial aid on time. They had attended summer orientation and they had completed all the other hoops that traditional freshmen go through to enter college. And it wouldn't be fair to them to help Patrick get into school. And then, she made the mistake of asking, why should I do it? And so there I was with just the right ratio of brains to, stu to stupidity <laughs> to tell the registrar what she should do and why she should do it. I was young, thought a lot of myself at the time, you know. And to which I responded, because you can. Patrick didn't have a mother and a father, an aunt and an uncle, or even cousins to help guide him through. He had me, but we were separated by about 400 miles of I-75. Patrick didn't have resources to pay for things like admission and application fees, or back in those days, you had to pay for financial aid, if y'all remember that. But he came up with those resources. He had a lot of talent and the ability to graduate from the university. He had attended all his classes and he had excellent grades, a fact to which his professors had attested as evidenced by their signatures on the FORSAD forms. Patrick, not having a meal plan, had begged and borrowed from friends to kill his hunger pains. Not having a dorm room, he had slept on the floor every other night with his cousin, yours truly, to be here. And he was doing far better than many other students who had met all those time sensitivities. And you, Miss Betty Davis, can make all his problems go away with the stroke of your pen. And so she signed it. And Patrick began his career as a freshman at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga in November of 1992. And today he has both a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a master's degree in leadership human resources and administration, and he is now an insurance agent doing very, very well for himself and his family. Patrick is no longer relegated to the fate of poverty, famish, food desert, and health disparities. And why, you ask? Because he is amongst that 33.4% of Americans that hold a higher education degree. Which leads me to the question, what if more students like myself and Patrick and others could define what excellent was for themselves? What if more students like us could speak the language of decision makers and thought leaders to leverage their experiences in their own vantage points? What if more students like us had a workable plan for things that mattered? What if they could learn skills that could make them professionally viable 
and ensure that their children and their future generations knew neither poverty nor the penitentiary. And I say that because in my neighborhood, that was a very common occurrence. If we want to address things like poverty, health disparities, crime, literacy, voter participation, and other things that are important to us, if we want a better state, we must graduate more students from these localities. According to numerous reports, the percentages of a state's population with a higher education degree influences not only the amount they will earn, but things like crime is drastically reduced. Civic engagement is highly increased. Volunteering is increased. Voting is increased. All these things that make strong, vibrant, thriving communities is increased exponentially with the percentage of individuals in a particular community holding at least a bachelor's degree. In the study, the benefits of higher education for individuals and society, 37% of Maryland's state population reportedly had a bachelor's degree and Maryland was the number one state in the country for total personal income. In Minnesota, 74.5% of its state population participate in voting activities across all levels, local, state, and national. Minnesota has 34.7% of all their residents hold at least a bachelor's degree. In Colorado, 38.1% of its residents hold at least a bachelor's degree. And Colorado is the number one state for literacy and adult skills in the country. Remember John Gardner's words about the disease not attacking the whole uh, body or not spreading to all the parts, but the impact being felt by the rest of the body? Well, if you consider crime, poverty, health disparities, unemployment, et cetera, as a disease, it is important to also remember why they may not necessarily extend into our communities, it does impact us. And thriving communities equal thriving states. A thriving Kansas means a better nation for us all. And I want to say thank you for hearing me today. And it's been my pleasure to speak with you. And at this time, I'll entertain any questions you may have. Yeah. Hey. So first, thank you for sharing your story. Um, so it was great that you were there for your cousin whenever your cousin was entering UTC. Who was there for you? Oh, wow. You know, that was, that, that was, that was a real different experience. You know, um, I come from a family that, that had never sent a, a person to college before. So I didn't have a lot of family support that way. And by that way, I mean people who knew how to navigate systems and, and make things happen and what have you. So um, uh, being a first generation student and a student with a disability, I was a participant in, in a program called Student Support Services. I had a number of faculty mentors who took an interest in me. And I also had some older African American men in a fraternity called Kappa Alpha Psi. Aaron is also a member of that fraternity um, who kind of guided me along and tried to make sure that, you know, I stayed on the right track and things of that nature. Dr. Chong. So why the drive towards 60% Kansas. It's critical for Kansas because if you want to see the state improve, you got to have more people completing, you know, higher education degrees, uh, preferably at the at least the baccalaureate level. And if not that, then maybe some uh, skilled trade or something at the associate degree. All those things, voting, crime, anything that you can think of that's important to a community and important to a state. It, you know, it all has a positive correlation to the percentage and the number of people that complete higher education. What advice would you have for faculty members on how to identify and help students that might need that little extra bit of support, especially if they're not necessarily um, gonna ask for it? 
I would say keep an open mind and be flexible. You know, this one size fit all type of mentality it, it isn't really true. You know, I talked about how my appeal letter was indeed my vantage point of excellence, right? The 2.3 grade point average, the 33 class rank and the class of, uh, what was it, 233 or 133, whatever it was, it was top quarter percent or top third. You know, given the circumstances, and where I live and everything that I went through, that was every bit as good as somebody who came from Farragut High School. You know, the issue wasn't that my GPA was so low. The, the, the real critical issue was that despite all these different things, I still had graduated. I still had completed all the core requirements to get into school, right? And I still had an ability to be successful in school. But without looking at the whole student, that would have never been known or appreciated or valued. What is the university doing to uh, help to identify and help first generation college students navigate the system and, and be successful? There's quite a bit going on, actually. We, we have a, a task force uh, that's led by Dr. Niehoff and Dr. Bannister looking at um, strategic initiatives and strategic efforts to not only identify but support first generation students. We just recently hired uh, Rebecca, is Rebecca here? No? Rebecca Paz as the uh, director or coordinator of that center and leading us in developing those strategies and initiatives to help work with first generation students. So uh, we're, we're making some leeway in that area. Could you please revisit the conversation you had with your mother, the 10 seconds that changed your life? Oh boy, did it. You know, I, you know my, my mother was um, a one, or is a wonderful lady, I should say. And you know, she, she had this way of calling your name and you knew if you were in trouble or you knew if maybe she had made a special dessert for you or something or whatnot. And so when, you know, when she stopped me, I mean, it's like, all you want to do is go to school and get out the door and you figure you're doing the right thing, right? You know, it's, it's 7.30 in the morning, you're, you're trying to go to school and she stopped you and you're like, what, what, what's happening, what's going on? Um, and she started talking about Shannon and Shannon had just stayed at our home maybe that weekend or something or a couple of days before uh, this thing happened. And, um, you know, knowing that he and I were friends, I guess she was thinking that, you know, there was some degree of probability that I would get into trouble or some kind of way would find his way to, to her doorstep or my doorstep. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for talking to kids and engaging with kids about a lot of things in Lonsdale. Drugs, crime, sex, you name it. Uh, but none of those things had ever happened until he got into trouble. And uh, once that happened, she felt the need to, to, to say something to me. And the good thing about that is, not only did she, you know, turn on a light in my head about looking for some other possibilities, but because I went to college, my cousin also went to college. And when I say my cousin, I'm talking about a different cousin than Patrick, uh, Dr. Javier Samuel, uh, the real Dr. Samuel. And I say the real because she got her doctorate before me, <laughs> right? And, and, and she did so as a single parent in that same community of Lonsdale. Um, you know, very strong, tenacious young lady. Um, and then from her, three more cousins got bachelor's degrees and master's degrees. So, you know, by, you know, turning on that switch and having that conversation with me, several people within the family are now college educated, nurses, uh, parole officers, counselors, and the like, and, and doing well, much better than their parents and their parents' parents. My thought is, how do we help the communities, the members, the families? You know, you were in high school. Can we? What can we do to help reach out to communities to impart the idea of higher education when those children are five years old, whatever the age is? How, what's our opportunity? There? First of all, we gotta we gotta do more of helping all the community understand 
uh, about the higher education opportunities. And when I say all the community, you know, I started out talking about Xavion. Xavion had a bright future because he was a football player. And anytime you're a football player, basketball player, baseball, soccer, boxing, some of these sports and activities, there are usually blueprints that help you go beyond that circle of life that you know. But when you're not a star football player or a star basketball player, there are no signs to tell you how to, how to navigate and what the opportunities might be, and more importantly, what resources are out there. So we got to educate students earlier about it, and we got to educate parents about these processes and uh, opportunities, scholarships, loans even, everything that can help a student successfully navigate the college landscape. And we got to do it earlier. And when I say earlier, I mean, it's really critical that that happens before they reach to this conclusion that there's nothing out there for them. Because once they get to that point, it is too late. At, at which point, I'm over here. Hi. <laughs> at which point did you know that you wanted to um, work in higher education? Oh, let me tell you. I, I know exactly when that happened. It was uh, 1993. In 1993, the uh, Federal Financial Aid Processing Center, or whatever it's called, was making changes about deadlines. It used to be that you could have your stuff in, you know, by June or May or something like that, and you were fine. But uh, something happened in 1993 to where they moved that back to February. And I think it's February now, February 15th. That's when that happened. And if you didn't have your A application in by February the 15th, then you stand to lose your aid, you know, Pell Grant and all these other things. And uh, a lot of people didn't understand that. And so the financial aid office had been working to hold these sessions and seminars and whatnot to help students understand it. But they couldn't get any traction. They couldn't get anybody to pay attention and come to these sessions. And so some kind of way, word got to me that this change was happening. And I was like, well, students need to know this. I was a graduate assistant working in student support services at the time. And they said, well, we've done all these things and we tried to uh, talk to students and you know, students won't respond and that kind of thing. And um, you know, we sent Daryl a, a, a message or we called him or this, that, and the other. We're looking for Daryl. And I said, well, you're looking for Daryl. Who is Daryl? Well, Daryl Baker. Okay, nobody knows Daryl Baker. Uh, you don't know Daryl Baker? No, we don't know Daryl Baker. Uh, you know, he go by the name Deuce. Oh, Deuce, yeah, yeah. I know Deuce. Everybody know Deuce. You go looking for Daryl, you're not gonna find him. You go looking for Deuce, you can have him in 10 minutes. <laughs> and so I said uh, to Mike Roberts, who was the director of financial aid at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga at the time, I said, I want you to do one more session. And I guarantee you it's going to be a packed house. As I mentioned earlier, I was a member of Kappa Alpha Psi, I still am. And I started with all the fraternities. I'm telling you, I went up and down fraternity row. I went to all the houses, all the sororities. I went to all the BSUs and all the, all the student groups or what have you. And by the time I got through, it was three or 400 people in there. And the session that was supposed to last an hour took about four hours. And when we dispersed and we were on our way out, everybody's leaving. I got up and I'm on my way walking out thinking nothing of it. And Mr. Robert said, hey, man, hey, come here. Let me talk to you a minute. And I went over there and, you know, I don't know if I'm in trouble or something wrong with this. Thing. You know, he said, you should work in higher education. He said, I don't know how you did what you did. But we've been trying for months and we didn't come close to what you did in a couple of hours. And so um, I go on and I'm thinking about it. And then Christmas holiday came up and I learned that if you work in higher education, it's at least in the state of Tennessee, when Christmas come up, you get 14 days off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of said, oh, yeah, I could do this. You know? <laughs> 
Any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So we have about 25 participants via Zoom oh, right now. Yeah. And we Dr. have Dr. Carol's class, right? <laughs> I saw her. Yeah. Uh, so this question is, are there any specific initiatives or strategies that you worked on at your previous institutions that you'd like to implement here at K-State? Oh, wow. I, I did quite a few. Um, when I was in Nebraska, we started this scholarship initiative. Um, you know, Nebraska, University of Nebraska, Nebraska system was pretty much devoid of diversity, uh, you know, when I got there in 2000. So uh, I started this scholarship initiative. I, at that time, I was on the Kearney campus, and you know we had a lot of things that we needed to have done. And the scholarship was about helping students come to the University of Nebraska at Kearney and choose the University of Nebraska at Kearney, and then do some work, start organizations, do programming and other things that could help liven up the campus and create a community of color. And when I did that, I mean, I'm telling you at every turn, there was somebody saying, no, you can't do it because of this. No, you can't do it because of that. This isn't gonna work for this reason or that reason, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so finally, when I presented to the, uh, the cabinet, I can remember the issue that surfaced at the time was that if we do this scholarship for the students, we would be buying our community. And I said, Okay, I get that. Let me ask you this question. How do we get our honors program students? How do we get our resident assistants? How do we get our football players and basketball players? We give them scholarships, right? Scholarships are based on talent and merit. Merit, your ACT, grade point average, and some of those other kind of things. And then talent, what you bring to the community that is of value to that university. And so um, that was a pretty significant initiative. It literally changed the lives of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students. I don't know that we have the devoid challenge, but you know, when we think about first generation, low socioeconomic status and some of those kind of things, there may be some kind of way that something like that could, could be useful here. Uh, do you happen to know the current state of uh, Lonsdale, Knoxville, Tennessee? Oh, do I? Yeah, I know. It's still rough. Uh, you know, um, what, what that video didn't show, first of all, I went to school with Xavion's mother, uh, Zenobia. We called her Tinkerbell, right? We've been calling her Tinkerbell since first grade. Um, but yeah, I, I know quite a bit about Lonsdale. Many uh, friends and relatives. My grandmother still live in the community, and I cannot go to the state of Tennessee for any uh, long period of time, and certainly not come within the region of Knoxville and not go to Lonsdale. I carry Lonsdale with me everywhere I go. It's a huge part of who I am. Right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I came from a rural area. I'm from Malaysia, so I graduated from high school, which is from a rural area. And then when I got into university, I can see there are differences between students coming from a, um, in the urban area schools and the rural area schools. They have pretty much a big gap of information, of access, of the opportunity of the education. So what is your opinion of trying to narrowing down the information access between these kind of schools? I think this, you know, my thinking about helping students from these desolated communities uh, go to college, I think that plays in urban and rural. I really do, you know. Um, I didn't grow up in a rural community, but, you know, I lived in Kearney, Nebraska, and, you know, I've driven I-70 enough to know that there are some communities that desperately need uh, some of this kind of thinking. Um, I, I think some of the challenges are quite different, though. For example, growing up in Knoxville and being a part of the Knoxville City Public Schools, we had rules on the books that, you know, if you had a pack of Hall's cough drops, for example, you could be expelled. It was considered a drug. Now, I like to think that people in the county schools, they occasionally use Hall's cough drops, right? 
I, I like to think that Tylenol, buffering, something. And I like to think that those students don't always go to the office or to the nurse's station and check in some process for administering those Hall's cough drops or those tablets or whatnot. And they certainly did not have the track record of being expelled from school for something that they could buy over the counter like that. So, I mean, I, I think it's an important issue for both urban and rural uh, communities, but I think some of those issues about why there is such a, a need are, are vastly different. Dr. Samuel, thank you for sharing your story, for sharing your values and your vision and for giving us insights that we can take away to consider as we work with students to provide equity and access to all. So let's give Dr. Samuel a hand again. I hope you'll join us for our upcoming speaker series. And also I wanted to point out a couple events coming up soon. The Wildcat Dialogues is a chance, especially if you're working with first year students, to help promote intercultural learning and conversation on our campus. And of course, KSU Night coming up October 9th. Watch for more details. Thanks and have a great rest of your day.